Today, our program that brings you all the latest news from the online websites. My name is Angie Meher and I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon in the studio here uh, by my guest, Major General Mahmoud Morsi, researcher at Chatham House London. It's a very good afternoon to you, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for coming in today. Uh, of course, we will be discussing the current situation in Egypt, plus the latest development in some countries. Let's start straight away with news from home, from Al Ahram Online. And the headline reads, 28.3% turnout in both of Egypt's parliamentary election stages, according to the HEC. The first and second stage of Egypt's parliamentary elections produced a 28.3% turnout rate. Egypt's High Electoral Committee announced late on Friday. In a press conference, the head of the HEC, Ayman Abbas, said that 15,206,000 110 out of 53,786,000 eligible voters cast their ballots in both stages and uh, the highest turnout amongst the 27 governorates in both stages was in North Sinai with a turnout of 41.6%. The lowest was in the Suez governorate with a turnout of 18.1%. The HAC also announced the turnout for the second state runoffs which took place on the 1st and 2nd December reached 6,253,987 voters with a rate of 22.3%. He also said that a total of 222 candidates in the second round secured their seats in the individual system, breaking down the winners to 85 members of parliament, with some as party affiliates, reaching a percentage of 38.3%, whilst the number of independent winners reached 137, with a rate of 61.7%. And he added that 12 women and 17 youths under 35 were amongst those winners. First and foremost, how do you view the whole process of the parliamentary elections as they were carried out in Egypt? I think the elections was very good. The, the second round was very good. The percentage is, is high more than the first one. Even the first day was less, mm. but it was fine. And I think we, by the end of the day, we have our parliament now. Mm. So I think it's very good. Uh, the security situation was, was high. The, the military and police was uh, we were organized and uh, just, uh, I think, the elections and all uh, went well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Let me ask you, now we have the Egyptian parliament, as you said. What are your expectations of the new Egyptian parliament? Okay. When you read the names and the, uh, all the members of the parliament, I, I think we have to think about three things, mm -hmm. the advice. First one, each, each parliament member, each, uh, each candidate, not candidate now, he's parliament member already. Mm -hmm. He just have now to think uh, in the next days, he's going to review the laws and the decisions have been taken. And he keep in mind that he came to this seat by the will of the people and he should watch it every decision he has taken in the, uh, in, in the, in the sake of the people. This is one. Mm -hmm. uh, second one, uh, uh, Egypt now as a state, we uh, go through a very hard time. We have threats from everywhere. We have in economics and socials and uh, over over all states from our borders so you need to have very very strong and uh, work up on that the third one he will uh, just he will s stay in this place not forever he will end uh, leave this uh, position and he will watch he will know that many people will going to examine what he did in the parliament mm -hmm. so i think by these three elements every parliament member will be take the right decision I think now with the government, with the, this hard time in Egypt, we, I think the parliament should should do well. Indeed, and we hope so too. And let's go to Al Ahram online. And the headline reads, uh, Egyptian Prime Minister to stress investment in meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. The Egyptian Prime Minister met with the Chinese President uh, late on Friday in South Africa's Johannesburg, where he discussed investment in Egypt at the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. Prime Minister delivered Egypt's President Abdel Fattah Sisi's salute to China's President and presented the Egypt's efforts to offer an atmosphere that encourages uh, investment in the country. He also delivered a speech on Saturday in Johannesburg during a session headed by the Chinese President. During his speech, he focused on the importance of Sino-African cooperation based on mutual interest and the necessity that China participates in development projects in the African continent, in addition to showing Egyptian measures taken to create a favorable atmosphere for investment and uh, investment opportunities. Uh, the importance of the Prime Minister's visit, in your opinion, to attend the summit? 
Yeah, I think also we, we need to attract and have many good uh, opportunities to let the investment coming back to Egypt. Mm. I think it's very important to one. And also I think he, ha he should have, he carry with him a big agenda with all the projects should be in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And as for China, China is a good member for Egypt with a co-partner very important to Egypt. They have a lot of projects in Egypt. I think they will doing uh, a good projects in the next What, time. in your opinion, sir, are some of the challenges that still face investors who are hoping to come and invest in Egypt. Now we have a government, we have a parliament, we have the political uh, transitional roadmap has been completed. So politically on the ground, uh, we seem to be on the correct path. But what are some of the challenges that still face investors that could deter them from coming to okay. invest here? I think three things. First one, uh, the, the last economic law. We have new law for economics in, in Egypt, investment in Egypt. This is very important to be reviewed by the government. Mm -hmm. I think because this, uh, uh, these laws have been issued a couple of months ago and should be, it was uh, coming in a quick one, should review very well mm -hmm. to guarantee uh, for the businessmen is coming to Egypt, mm. for investors. Mm. This is one. Second one, I think is, is the police and the government doing well in the security situation. Security situation has been improved highly, but I think it needs to, to do more, more, mm. more to go to with, uh, uh, with the security situation. Last one is just the businessmen, Egyptian one, who is working here in Egypt, they need to be participate and share more uh, in, in projects in Egypt just to uh, carry these people outside. If you, if you didn't see the people here from Egypt didn't uh, participate or j share in, uh, or build any investment in Egypt, uh, the other side will come. Mm. So I need the people here. So first. it needs to start with the Egyptians yes. themselves. Yeah, ex exactly. Right. Yeah. Let's go to the Daily Star Lebanon and the headline reads, uh, France flies spy missions over the Daesh held areas of Libya. French military aircraft have flown reconnaissance and intelligence missions over Libya, including areas controlled by the Daesh terrorist group, and more are planned. According to the press dossier provided ahead of President Francois Hollande's visit to the Charles de Gaulle aircraft carrier off the coast of Syria, two missions were flown on November 20th and 21st around the towns of Sirt and Tobruk. French warplanes have been bombing Daesh in Iraq for more than a year and in Syria since September. France stepped up its bombing in Syria after the attack by the Daesh terrorist group in Paris on November 13th that killed 130 people. The French government had not previously acknowledged carrying out operations over Daesh zones in Libya. Uh, Sirte is controlled by the terrorist group. Neither the defense ministry nor the president's office uh, did comment. First and foremost, how would you describe the situation now in Libya with the different parties taking further action? Uh, with especially with regards to airstrikes? Okay, uh, first of all, I think the problem with the government is still, still in the ground now mm. because uh, the government in, in Trablus didn't agree with some names with the, the, uh, the uh, running time government in, in, in Tobruk. Mm. And so it's still a problem with the government and the names. This is one side. And the other side is uh, going to airstrikes in Libya is very s dangerous, very serious. I, I think France who have been encouraged uh, to do more work in Libya. I say you, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't uh, take part with, with what happened in Syria and what happened in Libya. You know, you should join both two sides. I think no chance for other countries, maybe Libya or another NATO, uh, uh, NATO uh, states, coming to to hit and uh, uh, dash in Libya. Mm. So do you think that? Uh, the Libyan situation is could be a repeat of previous mistakes that have done bef that have been done before. Uh, I, I don't think so. Mm. I, I, I think this one this time they will be well prepared, mm. well very cautious of what's happening, and she had arranged the ground first before coming to hit any dash on the ground. Mm. I, I think this is a step now, and also I think it is would not happen before we have a, a, a government on the ground. Mm. Because, you know, coordination and cooperation between forces in the ground indeed. and other things is very important indeed. element. They could facilitate exactly. action yeah. for them, indeed. Right, let's go to the Khalij Times, and the headline reads, Three Palestinians killed by uh, Israeli soldiers. The Palestinians stabbed and wounded a soldier near Ramallah before Israeli troops opened fire and killed him. Three Palestinians attacked Israeli troops with knives in a separate incident on Friday before they were shot and killed by Israeli forces. Uh, this is the latest violence in more than two months of almost daily assaults against each other. The attacks that began mid-September are showing no signs of relenting. 
and the violence began over tensions at the sensitive holy site in Jerusalem and quickly escalated and spread to the West Bank, Israel, and the Gaza border. In Friday's attacks, a Palestinian stabbed and wounded a soldier near Ramallah, the West Bank, and uh, the military said the troops at the scene opened fire and killed the attacker. Earlier in the day, two Palestinians attacked a soldier with knives in the city of Hebron, also in the West Bank, wounding him before troops shot and killed him. Now, after this wave of violence that Gaza has witnessed over the last few days, how, how do you see this as playing out? Do you expect a further escalation? Do you, a lot of people are saying this could be the new uh, uprising or intifada as before. Do you think that this is uh, brewing for such an no, event? No, I, I think it doesn't going to be like intifada. Mm. It will be just limited in, in, in West Bank and in Gaza. Mm. And uh, the second one is, uh, is called the, the, the War of Knives or Knives War. Mm. And I think it will still for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, until someone coming and, and stop and have a consulate between the two parts. Uh, what are the prospects, though, of consolidating or reaching some sort of peace deal between the two parties? Because no talks are taking place now on the ground, I and the situation on the ground seems to be worsening. Yeah, I, I think because, you, you know, just if you, if you watch the names who are coming to have fight last mm -hmm. two days and stab the soldiers, Israeli soldiers, you've had these families, sons, daughters, sons, daughters, and in... in and so on. And if you listen to Moshe Alun yesterday, the Minister of Defense in Israel, he was talking a new wall, a new more block the Israel, block the Palestinians to coming to Ramallah and some areas. And I think it is not the solution. We still play on the wrong one. Mm. I think the solution is going with the two parties, with Palestinians, with Hamas, and just with Israel, and, and just get considered. But it, is, it doesn't work in this way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sir, how do you see the international community's role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Do you see it as a, a failure by the international community to intervene and reach some sort of resolution between the two sides? You know, it was the theme for, for, for Barack Obama time of, uh, uh, as a president for, for the United States. The United States was were busy for many things else, like Daesh, like Libya, like some uh, attacks, terrorist attacks. And all these things just takes take the view from, from Palestine. And each time something happened in the world, like this one, Israel takes a chance and make more problems for uh, for the Palestinians, mm -hmm. even in, in, in uh, Jerusalem or in, in Gaza. I, I think uh, the, the international should be, the international community should go more attention to Palestine. But I think it's still, we're still away because of Daesh and, and the war in Syria and in Iraq. Mm -hmm. They're still busy with that. Yes, exactly. Part. Yeah. All right, let's go to the World Bulletin. Headline reads, Hollande visits aircraft carrier off Syria. Uh, French uh, President Francois Hollande arrived uh, uh, Friday on France's Charles de Gaulle aircraft carrier to meet air crews launching strikes on Daesh terrorists in Syria and Iraq. Hollande is expected to give a speech to the crew, which is off the coast of Syria, three weeks after he declared war on the terrorists after attacks on Paris in which 130 were killed. Fighters taking off from the carrier have tripled France's capacity to strike Daesh in Syria and Iraq. Pilots have carried out 110 sorties from its deck since it arrived in the eastern Mediterranean on November 23rd. And the visit, the first time that a French head of state had visited an aircraft carrier, comes as Hollande tries to step up international military action against the group. The Charles de Gaulle, which carries a crew of around 2,000, sailed from its base in Toulouse in the south of France five days after the attacks on Paris. And the socialist president has seen a surge in his popularity ratings since he declared war on Daesh after the suicide bombers attacked uh, the French capital. Now, uh, first and foremost, a conference bringing together dozens of uh, figures from serious political and armed opposition is expected to be held next week yes. uh, in yeah. Riyadh. What are the prospects of reaching any sort of agreement during such a conference, in your opinion? You, you know, this agreement and this conference is going what after Bashar is leaving. Mm -hmm. And the problem is Bashar is still in, in place. Hasn't left. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And the problem is you think in one step in the future, but you didn't have the ground for this step. So mm -hmm. it is one problem. So you need to have, uh, I think the relations and the, the, the Saudi Arabia and the Middle East is, is going to find the solutions to who is coming the government, who is coming the elections in Syria. And I think it is, it is um, uh, very early, very early step to, to have these relations. But anyway, I, I think there is, that is that we let us look at the results of coming with this conference.
-hmm. Anyway, I, I think they're going to succeed because there's still a problem. I think the names, five names have been added today, mm -hmm. and I still mean more names is coming. And if you need to have a conference with 100 people, you would never get, uh, get solutions. Mm -hmm. How do you view the Germans joining the, uh, joining the fight against the Daesh terrorist group? Okay, uh, as you know, uh, France, after the tragic attack, they joined, France is, is, is now the, the, the gold carrier in the Mediterranean mm. to join it. And also Britain three days, four days ago, have taken a decision to, to join by, by four tornado uh, uh, aircrafts flying, for, for, uh, uh, flying from Cyprus. And also now is the, the turn of Germany. Mm. Because you know, uh, now we have France in first, Britain second, and Germany and all this, the EU uh, strong members, mm. they have coming together. So I, I think this is a political, a political decision. And there's now Russia as well. As Russia, no, no Russia is <laughs> the old guy on the ground. And I think, but the most important thing, if these four partners or three partners going to join the fighting, and they should uh, first of all cooperate with Russians. I have rule, new rules of en engagement with Russia, United States, with Turkish, and it will be very, very problems. We, we need as as a military to think very, uh, very careful how many people just targeting one target on the ground. Mm. This is the, the other thing, I, I was listening to John Kerry, uh, Foreign Affairs in the United States. He was talking about the, the importance is we have uh, forces on the ground. Uh, and it is very hard decision, very difficult decision, because you haven't uh, any support in the ground. And the scenario, many people talking about the scenario of about two or three, mm. when the uh, United States is coming to Iraq in mm. this year, and what, what tra tragedy and the problems mm. in this year, until now we still suffer. Daesh is, yeah, Daesh is one result, result of that. Of that. Mm. So the problem is that. So I, I think it's, it's very, very, very dangerous. We need to think about the scenarios. And we need to have wise people to thinking to find what is the right scenario for these states coming together and work. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's go to the Gulf today. And a headline reads, the Qaeda threatens to kill leader of pro-Yemen forces. al Qaeda threatened to kill the leader of a pro-government force in southern Yemen, putting a bounty on his head as it seeks to impose itself on the war-torn country. al Qaeda's branch in Yemen, in a statement circulated during the weekly prayers and mosques, vowed to kill Abdel Latif al-Sayed, the Abiyan provincial commander of the Popular Resistance, an alliance of Sunnis, tribesmen, loyalist soldiers, and southern secessionists. Accusing him of having stabbed the Mujahideen in the back, it placed a bounty of 7 million Yemeni rials, which is equivalent to 32,500 US dollars, on his head and warned that his accomplices would be regarded as legitimate targets. Meanwhile, the command of the Arab Coalition for Yemen called upon humanitarian agencies operating in Yemen to coordinate and provide the coordinates of their operations in cities beforehand to avoid any collateral damage as the coalition continues to defend Yemen's legitimate government. How do you describe this latest development in the Yemeni conflict? First thing, we, we know that sure about that, that Al-Qaeda have their own agenda. Mm. And you remember from as, as a, the war started, with have seen just a couple of months ago, Al-Qaeda uh, was controlling many areas and they still control. I, I think now the conflict been between Qaeda and Hussein to, to have some power in, 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 in because the war is coming to end. So the, the, the Qaeda is looking to get more power in some area. No one touch our area. This is the problem now in, 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 in Yemen. Mm -hmm. As you know, the, sto the, uh, the Hazm sto uh, storm, is, the war started a couple of months ago and still there is no Resolution. big results. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is no resolution of the war. The war is started. And the problem is, as Yemen very mountainous area, very hard to fight. It should be fight one to one. So it takes more time than we expect. But do you think now, as you said, the situation is between the Houthis and the uh, Qaeda. Qaeda? So where's the Yemeni government in this equation? And the Yemeni people, the humanitarian, now they're asking humanitarian groups to say where they're working so they don't get caught in the middle of the two wars on the ground. Yeah, I think the Yemeni government is still weak. Mm. And this is still the image of the government. Mm. You, the gov you, you know, you understand what is the element of the state. The, the element of the state is the government on the ground controlling the area and you have institutions mm. still we just have image mm. of the government mm. they don't control the area most areas of yemen uh, most areas is under uh, Hussein and Qaeda. and i think the problem is i i, I my fears my worries about if the government have interfered between the Hussein and the Qaeda will be the problem mm. they should the government goes relying with one of them to just solve the problem so do you see that as a possible end to the conflict in yemen 
Yeah, maybe. If the government yeah, it should. were to choose a yeah, side it of should. the rebels? It should, if you have Siri. Siri so uh, what would be the best of the worst? I mean, they're both very bad scenarios. The best scenario. of the worst is the government in Mediterranean to the Qaeda to solve the problem with the high sea, the half sea. Is so Qaeda is now a solution? Yeah, yeah exactly. And, well, and sometimes the Qaeda is a solution, sometimes. <laughs> because, you know, Qaeda don't have the ambitious the half sea in heads. Mm. The Qaeda is or, the just or the backing. Yeah. The Houthis have backing as well. By yeah. Uh, and, and don't forget who is Iran, mm, exactly. who, is, who, is the Shia, who is the Shia in, in, in the ground, who is Shia is working now. So it's another, another uh, key player on the ground in Yemen. So we have Hausiyin, we have Al-Qaeda, we have the government, we have the Shia or the Iran. How, how do you uh, manage all these uh, parties with their own agenda, with their own interests to just uh, have solutions? Mm. It's coming when you have more parties, you have more troubles. Indeed. Let's go to The Guardian, and the headline reads, FBI investigating San Bernardino shooting as an act of terrorism. Suspects attempted to destroy digital fingerprints, but uh, Tashfin Malik allegedly made a pledge of allegiance to Daesh in a Facebook post on the day of the attack. The FBI is investigating the San Bernardino shooting as an act of terrorism, it confirmed, giving the atrocity a national security dimension and renewed political urgency. The move comes after reports claim the woman accused of helping to slaughter 14 people in a gun massacre in California pledged allegiance to Daesh. Tashfin Malik, age 27, swore uh, fealty to the terror group in a Facebook post on Wednesday, the same day she and her husband, Sayyid Rizwan Farooq, committed the rampage. A Facebook executive said Malik's online post was made as the attacks began and law enforcement officials who briefed media organizations about the revelation said it could be a game changer in the, in the investigation. It is likely to shift political debate over the massacre, the worst mass shooting in the U.S. in three years. Speaking later in Washington, D.C., the FBI director, James Comey, said the investigation had been taken on by his agency amid indications of radicalization by the killers and because they had been potentially inspired by foreign terrorist organizations. So now... There has also been uh, recent uh, uh, reports that Daesh said that these two uh, terrorists are a part of their uh, group and they claimed uh, that they are part of the, what they call the caliphate. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, how do you describe this attack? Yeah. Uh, first of all, you know this, uh, this terrorist attack from 2000 until now, United States have suffered 160 attacks like that. Mm. This is the only one got double. Everyone got by one person. This is the only case is have two, uh, two husband and wife mm. uh, for, for launch this attack. Mm. This is one side. The other thing, you know, if you're watching the, the intelligence, FBI, the, the police, they didn't come to jump to conclusion. Mm. They, they tested the, the evidence. Mm. They're going for after their computers and phone mobiles, and they say, one, one, the wife, because they're saying the wife was... She pledged. She, she, she mm. pledged some, some, uh, by, by a fake name with mm. some, uh, some ISIS uh, uh, contact and mm. so But I, I think until now, there is a missing thing, because, uh, is, because this guy is American. He born in America. Mm. He, he, he traveled to Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, but he born in America. He has American rules, and he, f for there all his life, and uh, he has... Uh, uh, my nice life, but the problem is, I, I think the what is the, the motive for the act is That's not clear. That's the question. Yeah, this, the motive is not clear at, until now. Mm -hmm. Why he just makes this accent this time? I, I think there is not related to Dash. Dash maybe people try to use uh, Dash names or mm -hmm. something like that. But I think the motive, the real motive, is not clear until now. Until now, indeed. I'm afraid we've run out of time, Major General uh, Mahmoud Morsi, our researcher at uh, Chatham House, uh, London. Thank you very much, sir, for joining welcome. us this Thank afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, with that, we wrap up for this afternoon's edition of The World Today. Many thanks for watching.